Justin. We have a podcast. Diving, diving deep. deep. Diving deep into all things Texas. Both on and off the field. Here's Sean Pendergast. And Pro Football Hall of Famer. The General. Sean McClain. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Utopia. Hey everybody, welcome in to Utopia Football Podcast. It's week 16, I can't believe it's week 16 of the NFL season. And the Texans are very much alive in the hunt for a playoff spot. Lots of storylines to get into on the heels of the big win in Tennessee last week, leading into Cleveland this weekend. And uh, to break it all down, I am Sean Pendergast, one half of Payne Pendergast, Sports Radio 610, joined as always by my good friend, the Hall of Famer, and our senior columnist at SportsRadio610.com, the great John McClain. John, how are you? Sean, I'm doing great. It's just hard to believe we're talking Texans and playoffs at this time of the year based on where they were going into the season. Three-way tie for first place with Indy and Jacksonville. It makes going to work every day so much more fun because, you know, when they win, it's more fun to talk about, more fun to write about, more fun to pot about. And uh, everybody is so fired up about the Texans. Even if they don't win another game, they've still had a successful season. Yeah, I would say so. They they have now. You know, if these if they if they if we get three more if we get three Jets game like performances in the last three games, <laughs> then I am. But then I reserve the right to be overall happy with how the season went. But if they if they're if they're battling and more so, John, if they're without C.J. Stroud. Um, look, we still don't know how long he's going to be out for. He could be back this weekend. He could be back uh, in two weeks. We, you know, we don't know. Concussions are weird. Um, so the latest on C.J. Stroud is he's still in the concussion protocol. Um, Aaron Wilson had reports that he was still suffering from sensitivity to light. Um, so that doesn't sound imagine he goes back to Davis Mills for some reason against uh, the, the Cleveland Browns. Um, but uh, – I have a whole lot more confidence in Case getting it done after watching him play in Tennessee this past weekend. I think Case probably does too. So does D'Amico Ryans, Bobby Slowick, Drive Johnson, all of them. Because he's now 3-0 and over his last four years. 2-0 and with the Browns two years ago. Now 1-0. and um, they, We're not going to know for sure till Friday till we see uh, the designation on the injury report. He's got to come out for a walkthrough. Then he's got to go through a regular practice. So we're not going to know till Friday. I'm going to just guessing if you held my foot to the fire, I'd say yeah. Case Keenum's going to play in this game. And and uh, Case ought to feel a whole lot better. Got that pick six out of his system and was able to bring them from 13 points behind in one of the most inspirational victories they've ever had, considering all the injuries they had and the magnitude of the game. Yeah, John, I, I think we'll I think we'll know by Wednesday. Like if he's if it's Wednesday and he's still not even with the team, because that was a big thing to me last week is he wasn't even around the team. You know, he wasn't even out at practice. He was barely in the building. If you, you know, if you're if you listen to the reports that people around the team had last week, if if it's Wednesday for me and he still isn't even out on the field, he ain't playing on Sunday, in my opinion. Well, you might um, be right. Yeah. Um, but uh but case, you know, case got the job done. It's funny. Um and I, I hope I'm not hijacking your news and notes, but do you um, do you remember the last time Case Keenum and Joe Flacco faced off at NRG Stadium? Uh, I do not. I haven't thought about it. Well, that would be the game where Case was pulled out of a deer lease in 2014. If you remember, the first <laughs> game he played was a 25-13 to 13 win over Joe Flacco and the Ravens that nobody thought the Texans were going to win because they're playing a quarterback who was who was on the street, ironically, a lot like Joe Flacco a few weeks ago. Um, I mean, there's so many parallels with all this stuff uh, that, uh, yeah, Case was pulled out of that deer lease and they faced off at NRG Stadium. And I've already got a segment built tomorrow for Payne and Pendergast where I've got all – I went back and looked at the box score of that game, just all the fun little factoids and weird things about that game. Randy Bullock kicked six field goals with special teams player of the week that week, much like Timmy Fairbairn is probably going to win special teams player of the week this week. Um uh, Arian Foster threw a touchdown pass in that game to C.J. Fedorowicz. <laughs> the only touchdown the Texans scored was was uh, was Arian Foster to C.J. Fedorowicz. That, of course, was 2014, which was J.J. Watts, um, J.J. Watts near MVP season. Um, and that was a game, John, that kept the Texans alive for the postseason. You know, that the case, if we're looking for parallels, you know, case keeping a season alive and going, that happened back in 2014. It's just strange. It's not an exact parallel, but the fact that he's facing off potentially if he plays this weekend case against Joe Flacco, it's just funny to me that that's the same quarterback he faced 
when he was pulled off the street to play quarterback for the Texans back in 2014. I should have known that because I went to Baltimore before that game to do a story on the offensive coordinator of the Ravens, Gary Kubiak, and their tight end, Owen Daniels, and they got beat. And um, I had a blast up there writing about them and everything. There were some other former coaches, Rick Dennison, that Kubiak had brought, brought in. But that was a big, big, big victory. Yeah, huge. And hopefully Case does it again against Joe Flacco on Sunday. All right. Uh, so that's that's the big story. Uh, John, I guess the other names we'll be looking at on the injury report tomorrow or <laughs> looking at practice footage to see who's out there and whatnot. Will Anderson's a big one this weekend. Um, Jimmy Ward, I got to imagine, is going to be sitting with C.J. Stroud somewhere uh, in the concussion protocol this weekend. Uh, if CJ still on the concussion protocol, because Jimmy Ward looked like he was on Dream Street in the first quarter of that game when he took that, I say took the hit, like he kind of took the hit from Denzel Perryman. That's what, Denzel Perryman is the one who brought most of the force in that hit that knocked Jimmy Ward out of the game. But Jimmy Ward's a big one. Will in, Will Anderson's a big one. Blake Cashman, Nico Collins, John. These are these are huge names um, that the Texans hopefully get back. If you could pick one to come back and play this weekend, who would it be? Uh, well, first of all, let me say Jimmy Ward isn't going to play. Yeah. You know, the way he plays football, there's no way they're letting him go back out there because he yeah. can't slack off. Not sure about Cashman. I'm guessing Anderson's going to miss another game, and I think Nico Collins will be back. So I'll say Nico. And then Will Anderson, the guy who took his place. Derek Barnett had a sack. He knocked down. Uh, Will Levis two times, played the run well, part of a great defensive performance. So it's amazing the job that they do in their defensive line this season, no matter who plays, like Khalil Davis had their first sack. And I think Matt Burke, the defensive coordinator, defensive line is his baby. And Jacques Cesaire is a defensive line coach. And I think Matt Burke has a lot to do the performance up front, doing it like exactly the way Miko Ryans wants. So I'm hoping that they get uh, Collins back for sure to give uh, Case Keenum another target. Um, do you? So you said you think Will Anderson's going to miss another game? Yeah, that's just my opinion. I mean, just be you're wrong. just guessing. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to imagine Will Anderson wants to get back for this game badly, John. And the reason why, when you think about it, um, this is the first quarterback the Texans are going to be facing in quite some time <laughs> that you know is going to be in the pocket when you get to the pocket. <laughs> like Flacco ain't going nowhere. Uh, you think about the quarterbacks they played, really, if I'm just in my brain, I'm going back chronologically here. Levis can move. Um, two weeks ago, Zach Wilson can move. Russell Wilson can move. Uh, Trevor Lawrence can move. Tyler Murray can move. Hell, even I mean, Joe Burrow is no slouch moving around. Baker Mayfield can move. Like this is this is the first quarterback they faced, I guess, probably since maybe Derek Carr in week six. Yeah, probably because Bryce Young before Baker Mayfield. Bryce can move a little bit. I mean, this is the first like pocket pocket guy that they'll be facing since maybe Derek Carr in week six, I would guess. Um, if I'm Will Anderson, I want to be out there. This might be my three sack game that I can go get with Joe Flacco, like a statue back there. Yeah, I hope he doesn't have to wait till the next game when uh, Will Levis comes back to town so he can get to be a part of that party that just sacked him seven times. Sack party. Yeah, sack party. All right. What do you got for news and notes, John? We're talking about the playoffs and uh, I have a column on sportsradio610.com about the playoffs and how each team stands between Indianapolis and Houston and Jacksonville. And it's interesting. The Texans have given up the fewest points of those three teams. And the Jaguars are having the most trouble right now. They've lost three in a row. Uh, They're three and four at home. Both of these teams have losing records at home. Uh, in, in, Jaguars, like when, you say, when you say both of these, you're talking Indy and Jacksonville have losing yeah, records. Talking oh, about okay, the teams that are tied for first. Jacksonville gotcha. is three and five at home. Indy's three and four. Jacksonville is five and one on the road, hmm. and Indy's five and two on the road. Jaguars have lost three in a row. Trevor Lawrence is uh, in a concussion protocol, and he's still yeah. working with that sprained ankle. And and the Colts with Gardner Minshew. They're five and one in their last six games. So the Texans, who are five and two over the last seven, they're five and two at home, three and four on the road. They, the Texans and Colts right now are playing a whole lot better than the Jaguars. Yeah, they're 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 playing better. The problem for those two teams is 
if there is a three-way tie atop the division, the Jags are going to win that tiebreaker because they, the the Jags are two and zero against the Colts and one and one against the Texans. They, you know, the cumulative head-to-head games among those three teams, the Jags have the tiebreaker. Uh, and the Jags, if the Texans, let's say the Texans beat the Colts in Week 18, and the, it's down to them and the Jags for the division. In all likelihood, the Texans are going to have to probably win the division by a full game because most of the tiebreakers, I think, and this may, I may, I may be hijacking things that are in your notes. And if I am, I'm sorry, John, but the, the Jags, I think the, the tiebreakers are all either with or very much leaning towards the Jags right now, if I'm not mistaken. If the playoffs started today, the Jags would be division champions. The Colts would be a wild card and the Texans would be the first team on the outside looking in. And of the remaining schedules, the Texans have the toughest. Their opponents are 22 and 20. Hmm. The uh, uh, Colts' opponents are 20 and 22. And the Jaguars' opponents, it's it's amazing how easy their schedule is at this point, 14 and 28. Wow. So the Jags play some trashy teams. Although, they, John, they play Tampa Bay this weekend. Um, that, that number, by the way. <laughs> That number's kind of skewed because Carolina's one of the two teams well, that so the Jags play. Well, so is Tennessee. Play. So they're yeah. five and nine, two twelve, and then the Bucks are seven and seven. They don't play a team with a winning record. The Texans play two with winning records, and the Colts have one left with a winning record, and that would be the Texans. Yeah, I you know they the Colts play Atlanta this weekend in Atlanta. Atlanta's still playing for something. You know, I think that 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 game's going to be tough. Texans lost in Atlanta. They know that firsthand. Um, the big one this weekend is that Tampa Bay Jacksonville game, because if the Texans can beat Cleveland, you know, then 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 you got Tennessee and Indy the rest of the way. Um, the Texans need the Jags to lose another game if they're going to win the division. Like there's no there's no tie scenario that I feel good about them beating the Jags in a tiebreaker. And I think this is the best chance, especially given the fact there might not be any Trevor Lawrence in this game if he's in the concussion protocol. We've seen quarterbacks come out of concussion protocol inside of a week this season. Derek Carr and Brock Purdy both came back the same week they were put in the protocol. C.J. Stroud obviously did not. Um, but Tampa Bay is playing some really, really good football right now. Uh, so that's And it's in Tampa. So that's that's a big one if you're a Texan fan. Same way, I was, same way John, we were circling Buffalo and Dallas last week, and we saw how that worked out. Thanks a lot, Cowboys. Thanks for nothing. Um, I'm circling Tampa Bay and Jacksonville this week, and I'm sort of power ranking – the games, the non-Texan games on the schedule of, of, in terms of importance for the Texans. Jacksonville at Tampa Bay is a monster, monster game for the Texans in the AFC South this weekend. Texans need the Jaguars and the Colts to lose on the road. Yep. Now, Sean, we all know the Texans, nine of the last 10 games have come down the last 30 seconds, including four with no time left. Texans are 2-2 in those games. But if nine of those games, there's only one that was decided by seven, none by six. So eight games have been decided by five or fewer. Eight. That is amazing. Six by three or fewer. So this team, when D'Amico Ryan's talked about, said we're battle tested. They are battle tested. No team has gone through what they have with so many close games. And it's amazing that there's six and three in those nine games. Yeah, I John, I those are those are great stats as far as the margin goes. I, I I like to look at how much time is left when the game essentially is decided, like the deciding play. You know, like the Kyler Murray fourth down heave. You know, that's incomplete. You know, the Texans have to take a knee, but the game was decided on that play. I know the average for the eight games prior to the Titans win, the win over the Titans was eleven seconds left in the game when the deciding play happened. Obviously, that number has gone down. What with the game being decided with zero 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 left on the clock and Kaimi Fairbairn in this last one, so it's probably under. I would guess now it's ten seconds or under ten seconds. Um, uh, is how much time has been left when the Texans have clinched each of these games? John, did you happen to see the video of Kaimi Fairbairn's field goal from field level that Drew Doherty took? I don't know if you saw that. No, I, I tweeted not. it out. He he took a he Drew Doherty, of course, to the Texans. He's down on the field during the game because he's getting content for Texans TV and whatnot. He filmed from his iPhone, it looked like. He filmed the, the game-winning field goal, but he kept the camera on Kaimi. He didn't follow the ball. He just kept the camera on Kaimi kicking the field goal. <clears throat> and it was so funny. Kaimi kicks it, watches it, 
turns, just starts slowly walking back towards the bench, takes his helmet off and just drops it and starts kind of walking like this, like almost like a hitter who just hit a walk off, tossing their helmet off kind of thing. It was so cool. It was, it was really, that was, that, that was a fun game for, for a game. That was, if you told me a game was 1916 as a final score, I'd be like, okay, well, that sounds kind of ugly. And the game was ugly at times, but that, that game had a lot of action in it. The, the, the each team had the ball twice a piece in the final three minutes of the game. Like, it, like the Texans scored to tie it up with three minutes and three seconds left. Each team got the ball twice after that in the final three minutes of regulation. That's crazy to me. Another thing about Fairbairn's field goal, it made mm-hmm. it, it would have gone in from 64 yards. It went up on the net. Yeah. I mean, he just boomed it. And I thought it was very good. D'Amico Ryans was asked why he didn't run more plays. And he said, because he knew they were in – within his range, and he didn't want to take a chance on a hold or, or a false start or something like that, and he turned out to be exactly right. That was the first time they've won a road game in overtime since September of 2018 at Indy, which started a nine-game winning streak. And they had seven sacks, two and a half by Jonathan Grenard, giving him 12 for the season, and that is sec- tied for second most in team history behind eight in Jacksonville. In 2016, a victory over Jacksonville. And then their 12 tackles for loss, it seemed like every one of them was Derrick Henry. I mean, that guy, he just got smothered. That was the second most till they had 15 in 2009 against Seattle. Oh, God, I don't even remember that one. Usually I'm pretty good at recall on stuff like this. I have no recall of that Seattle game in 2009. <laughs> That's all um, the general news and notes. Well, John, I, I'll, can I add one here? A, sure. A, a Pender news and notes for the Derrick Henry, uh, the Derrick Henry stat right there, the Derrick Henry talk. Um, I saw, I think the Texans tweeted this out actually, that it was the first time in history, in the history of the NFL, that a player touched the ball 20 or more times and gained 15 or fewer yards from scrimmage in a game. Yeah, it's never man. happened before. Never happened. It's crazy. Great defense. Two weeks from now, I'm guessing he's not going to want any part of this defense after what he went through, especially knowing his career in Nashville could be over. And uh, he said after the game, uh, I kind of wanted to go out in the playoffs like he knows it's going to be it. But he could return. They got a lot of money to spend. It's just a matter of how much they want to spend on a running back who turns 30 in January. Well, and who's got – I mean, John, nobody's got more – wear on the tread than Derrick Henry over the last few years I don't care how big you are like he's taken a lot of hits a lot of hit what did I see on the broadcast on Sunday 50 percent of his 50 5 percent of his carries this season he's been hitting the backfield because their crazy. offensive line is awful it's trash boy that Skaronsky pick looks po- positively Kenyon Green-esque right now at left guard a little uh, just made him look terrible oh yeah just yeah really really destroyed him um, all right, John, that was good stuff. I love the general news and notes with John McClain. You ready you. to do ready to do so? You're welcome. You ready to do some mailbag? Sure. All right, let's do some mailbag questions. H O U mailbag at gmail.com. H O U mailbag at gmail.com is how you get in touch with us. We got a few good questions here. We got one right off the top. Christopher's a listener in New Jersey. He says, Love the podcast, guys. Love listening up here in New Jersey. Christopher, thank you for listening. Um, and Christopher's just looking for, okay, can someone just net out the playoff scenario for us with three games to go for the Texans? If they went out, are they in? What are the chances of the division? John, I thought you laid the division out pretty well. They're right in the thick of it for the division, but they need the Jags to lose at least another game. I think the thing you need to know about the playoffs for the Texans, let's just talk playoffs, is that I think two things. One, one is in, just in general. The other is about the game this weekend. If they win their last three games, they're in the playoffs. Period. They, because one of those games is against Indianapolis, and by definition, if you win, if you go three and zero down the stretch, one of those wins is going to knock Indianapolis down to ten and seven. You're going to be eleven and six. They've got the tiebreaker right now over Buffalo, who's an eight and six team. Um, the tiebreaker. They got the better conference record. If they win out, they're going to have you know the, their conference record is only going to improve if they win the rest of their games. So I think that's the big thing that with three weeks left in the season, the Texans and put the Texans have put themselves in a position where if they, if they win each of these games, they're going to be in the postseason. That's number one. Number two, as far as this game goes this weekend, John, obviously if they win, it's big. You know, you're, you're now tied with Cleveland at 9-6, and six and you have the head-to-head tiebreaker over them. But if the Texans lose this game, 
Cleveland will be a team that they can't catch. You know, if they lose this game this weekend, they'll be eight and seven. Cleveland will be 10 and five. There's two games left in the season. But even if they both finish 10 and seven, Cleveland's going to have the tiebreaker over them by virtue of beating them at NRG Stadium. So for the Texans, there's really four pathways into the playoffs winning the division or any of the three wild card spots. If you lose to Cleveland this weekend, then essentially, let's pretend these are the three wild card spots. Essentially, you're taking this wild card spot and it goes, it's frozen. You can't get it because you can't catch Cleveland. So that's, and who knows if you lose this game to Cleveland, you know, if the Jags win and the Colts win, then all of a sudden the division becomes a really, really uphill climb as well. So this is a massive, massive Christmas Eve game on Sunday. It's huge. I can't see Indianapolis at five and one in the last six with a good running game at Gardner Minshew playing very well. If Anthony Richardson had been their quarterback all year, they wouldn't be in this situation. Yep. He was too up and down, had too much to learn after only 13 starts at Florida. But they play at Atlanta, then they host Las Vegas. So really, they should be 10 and six going into that last game against the Texans, and they get to play it at home. But they do have a losing record at home, and the Texans have won there before. It's just amazing, Sean, the way this is all playing out. And who would have thunk? Certainly not us. I've had people tell me, oh, I predicted before the season they were going to be in a playoff contention. I said, yeah, show me where you predicted it. Yeah, right. Because I don't know anybody that did. I did a thing with the Boy Scouts of America, an annual breakfast fundraiser, in which I interviewed Cal and Hannah McNair, and a guy came up to me for, beforehand. He asked me how many wins I thought the Texans would get. And I said, oh, I think they're going to go 6-11. and 11. He said, I think they can win 9 or 10 games. He said, I think they got a chance to make the playoffs. And I said, well, I said, with all due respect, I disagree with you. But if you're right, find a way to get back in touch with me. Mm-hmm. And I'll go on my show and my podcast and tweet, you are a genius who predicted it before the season. Mm-hmm. And has he come back to you yet, John, or is he waiting to kind of no, see? No, you better wait because there's, you know, he's got to have nine or ten. Okay, I think he's yeah, looking for just, nine. I was wondering if he's just kind of setting things up and making sure, like, hey, I know I haven't, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but just in case, here I am. Here's my name. The only and, way uh, he's going to be able to get in touch with me because I don't put my email out there on my columns like I did with the Chronicle. Oh, gotcha. Is, uh, he'd have to send me a DM. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> And he's going to have to, that's going to get mixed in with all those lovely ladies who are DMing you all the time on social media. (laughs) It's going to get, it's going to get mixed in. Um, So, yeah. So I guess in response to Christopher, yeah, like they win, they win their last three games. They're in the postseason. Just win, baby. Just win, baby. Yeah. Still have a decent shot at the division. This Cleveland game is massive. The Indy game is massive in week 18. That's what you need to know. And the Kadarius Tony offside is we all laugh at Patrick Mahomes and him complaining about the call and everything that that call screwed a lot of teams in the AFC by allowing the Buffalo Bills to keep hanging around this playoff race. Cause I'll be honest, they're the best of all these. I'll include Cleveland in here of all the wild card and teams and wild card contenders right now. Um, the bills are the best of all those teams. They're the in team my nobody wants to play. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's keep it moving with the mailbag here. Um, JR and Spicewood, who has become a frequent emailer to the uh, to the Utopia podcast. Love the show. I'm so glad D'Amico listened to the Utopia podcast mailbag last week when I said he should play Case over Mills. We did get some people emailing about that. It's funny. Um, I think if CJ doesn't clear protocol early this week, he should play Case against the Browns. A couple of questions. Does, Case, does playing Case this week mean we have seen the last of Davis Mills? Do you think he'll be traded? or released in the offseason. John, what do you think? What say you about the future of Davis Mills? No way he's going to be released. And I don't see them trading him because what could they get? Their quarterback situation is better than almost every team in the league. They got three guys who started multiple – two backups who started multiple seasons and have won games. Mm -hmm. I was stunned they started case over Mills. Mills won in Nashville last year. He threw for 301 yards, three touchdowns, with a 128 rating against – the Titans his rookie year. So I was stunned when they did it. D'Amico didn't go into any detail, just said we thought it gave us the best chance to win. But from what I understand, Casey looked really good in practice, plus the fact he played in big games and offered yeah. the Minnesota Miracle and uh, and some other comebacks. And even though he hadn't played, started two games the previous four years, they were confident in him, and it turned out, like most D'Amico decisions, it worked out. 
Yeah, it worked out. And I too think that if if Davis had a devastating mistake early in a game, early in the game like Case did with that pick six, I don't know that he bounces back the same way Case did in that game. You know, like I I don't know. It, maybe it's their demeanor. Maybe it's because Davis is so bland. Um, but for whatever reason, like I just look at their personalities and it feels like Case's Case – seems to be a little less deer in the headlights than Davis Mills, like his ability to bounce back after making a big mistake. And maybe Davis doesn't even make that mistake in the first place, you know, kind of lauding case while talking about how he made an error that almost cost them the game. And he may um, not have made that. He just took the blame for it. Wouldn't surprise he, me if it wasn't a Goomba Wally. Yeah. Yeah. He do He did take the blame for it he multiple did. That's times. What good quarterbacks yeah. do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, J JR's other question is, um, least likely to happen again. Texans wearing Letterman jackets to an away game or Titans wearing Oiler throwbacks against the Houston Texans? Well, they'll wear them again next year, and I think we'll never see those leather jackets anytime or any place. That should be a collector's item. Uh, yeah, John, if they won that game wearing those Letterman jackets, it would have been the most popular item in the team store. Yeah, they um, got their ass whooped. They did, and so now they're poison. Now they're just a laughing stock. Now they're used for uh, to line bird cages and things like that. Um. So, so you think the Titans? I they're gonna obviously they're gonna wear the Oiler uniforms again. You think they'll do it against the Texans again next year? No, I don't have any idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Otis, my man. Otis says, "What the hell's going on with Damian Pierce? Four snaps? That's the whole email. <laughs> what is going on with Damian Pierce? David John? Singletary has stepped up and taken put a strangle all on that starting job. He's adjusted to the system better. Uh, he seems to read the line better." And the blind did a better job. I thought Charlie Heck, when I watched it, Charlie made a bunch of really good blocks. Now he made some mistakes. He hadn't played since last year. Yeah. And I'm guessing fans healthy, they're going back to fan. But Charlie Heck acquitted himself very well. But Singletary just fits in this system so much better. Yeah. I had a moment last night, John, where I felt really old. As you know, Charlie Heck lives in the, the floor below me in my building. And I was with my son, Sammy. Amy and I took Sammy out to dinner for Christmas last night because he's heading up to Chicago to see his mom. And we took him out to dinner and we got back to our building and we were in the lobby walking in and Charlie was there with his wife walking in with their dogs. And I stopped and I introduced Sammy to Charlie. And I said, this is my son, Sammy, Charlie. And I looked at Charlie and I said, Sammy, I went to school with Charlie's, with Charlie's dad. I'm like, man, I feel super old right now. <laughs> that really yeah. hammered home to me. Like, here's my son, and here's Charlie. And, oh, yeah, that's right. I went to school with Charlie's dad. Yeah. It was, Andy it was, uh, Chief's Andy offensive Heck. line coach. He, and a hell of an offensive lineman back in the yes, day. Yes, he was. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, Chris is in the ATL. And Chris, Chris asks, is Mills a Texan next season? I think we kind of touched on that earlier, John. Like, I obviously, they're not going to release him, and who knows what he could get in a trade. There's zero reason to move. Like, there's why would you move? As you just said, John, they've got the deepest quarterback room in the NFL. Why would you move off of that if it's still, A, cheap, and, B, you got three guys that aren't making a squawk about anything playing time-wise? And they don't make much money, and yeah. so – I think it's a good situation because in this day and age, you better, if you got to have a second one. And if you got a third one, in case you have to go to them, like 49ers got caught last year, like that, not, not doing it again this year, you got to be prepared next year. Let's be honest. If the Texans are going to be competing for the division, who knows? Maybe even yeah. the Super Bowl. Yep. You never know. Uh, Chris also asked, what is the, I like this question because usually people are like, what's your favorite Christmas song? Chris says, what's the Christmas song? that you change when it comes on because you can't stand it. Do you have a least favorite Christmas song, John? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, let me think a minute. Um, uh, cause I love Christmas. I love Christmas yeah. songs. Carol keeps them on in the house. Um, a least favorite Christmas song that causes me to change the channel. I can't think of one. I can't I think of one that I really dislike. I don't I don't have one that I super dislike that I can think of off the top of my head. I'll tell you one that I think is very overrated. Santa Claus is coming to town, Bruce Springsteen version. It gets played a ton. 
I think is very overrated. Santa Claus is coming, coming to town. town. Santa Claus is Santa coming to town. town. Yeah. Santa Claus is coming to town. And Clarence is playing that sax. Yeah, Clarence Clemens, I can deal with Clarence Clemens. and Little Steven, otherwise known as Silvio Dante from the you know, Sopranos. It's terrible to say this because of what it was for. Yeah, and I liked it the first thousand times I heard it. But do yeah. do they know it's Christmas? Oh, that was a uh, band aid, right? Yeah, I don't sing that anymore like it did for 20 years. Yeah. So tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. I wonder how Lou Holtz would sing one of those songs. So tonight, thank God it's them instead of the lady on the dome who's about to love, a trust, a commitment, a belief in one another. 80% of the people don't care about your problems. The other 20% are glad you have them. <laughs> Uh, all right let's keep the mailbag moving that was for you john merry christmas thank you uh, oh thank you lou that's, <laughs> it's no problem john you're a hall of famer and a great individual <laughs> all right joe q says texans dolphins jets titans have done a bit of a world cup style group play last the last two weeks based on the outcomes of the four games each team one and one how would you handicap possible texans at dolphins playoff match assuming that cj nico Jimmy Ward, basically assuming that the, the 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 people that could be healthy are healthy. What would you say, John, if the Texans had to travel to Miami to face the Dolphins in the wild card round? Well, of course, Miami would be heavily favored. Uh, they got a good look at each other during uh, joint practices oh, in preseason. Yeah. I'd love to see Derek Stingley Jr. trying to keep up with Tyreek Hill and uh, Steven Nelson and Jalen Waddle. They've got who who used to be. Devin A. Chain, now is Devon A. Chan. Yeah. A rookie who's had a lot of injuries, but man, he's so good. He monstered as 19 or 20 touchdowns. It would be offense versus offense. And and uh Texans, boy, they they had trouble covering deep, that's for sure. But yeah. I think it'd be an offensive oriented game, very exciting. Take the over. Yeah, I think take the over as well. Along those lines, Joe Q has a trivia question related. Which are the only two AFC teams to not reach the AFC title game since the Texans entered the NFL in 2002? Well, let's see. 2002, I'm saying the uh, Texans, I know, are one of them. Yeah. yeah. And the Browns? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. The Browns. Okay. Which are the only two AFC Browns teams didn't not get to reach the championship the game? They did under. Uh, uh, in the since the Texans came in bed. Yeah, no, yeah, okay, Joe Q. You you got to do better on your trivia. The Browns have not made the AFC title game since the Texans. He says the answer is the Texans and the Dolphins, and the Dolphins have not made the AFC title game. But yeah, neither of the Brown. I know he's listening right now. Joe Q, be better. The Browns have not made the AFC title game since the Texans. Now I can't trust any of your trivia questions, Joe Q. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah, Browns the Dolphins made it under Bernie Kosar, but they didn't make it uh, since they came back. Right, they won. They won a playoff game one with Belichick in Cleveland, and then they won one with Stefanski in 2020, yep. and then they lost the next round. Beat the right, Steelers right. So last it's time. really, yeah. I now that, but I and as I'm going through the teams in my head, like I think I do think every other team aside from Cleveland, the Texans, and the uh, and the Dolphins have made an AFC title game in that time frame. Uh, as I'm going through kind of, I'm just, I go through the divisions in my, in my head here. Um, I think everybody else has made at least one. Uh, all right, let's get a couple more of these in, John. This is just more of a commentary than it is a question in the email. Our friend Dave in Round Rock says, here's the updated AFC South standings. Jacksonville, eight and six. Indianapolis, eight and six. Texans, eight and six. Tennessee Titans, four and eight. Houston Oilers, one and one. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Uh, speaking of which, Marcus says, is it safe to say we never have to worry about Derrick Henry ever, ever again? I don't think it's safe to say because, you know, when he comes here in two weeks, he's going to want to come back with a vengeance. But they're, they are so bad up front. Like Sean mentioned earlier, he's been hitting the backfield on 50% of his carries. And I'm sure almost every one of them was in the backfield Sunday. So I feel comfortable, not confident, but comfortable that they're going to have another great game against him. I wrote a column last week about that, considering he had averaged 203.6 yards and 7.1 a carry in previous 
five games, but their run defense is really good. Mm -hmm. And right now it's great. They're going to stuff the Browns running game. Cleveland has a lot of problems up front caused because of injuries, just like the Texans and Flacco is having to get rid of the ball quick. So I think uh, it's going to be, it'll all come down to the quarterbacks, Flacco versus Keenum, a 38 going on 39 versus 35. And a quarterback who plays well is going to win because I don't think either one of them will run the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, man. The Browns are dynamite against the run, just like the Texans are, like you said. Um, John, one more thing. This is a mailbag question from Sean in Upper Kirby. Um, who is the greater Texan backup quarterback cult hero? I put up this poll the other day. DJ Yates. Yates. You take Yates over Keenum, huh? Absolutely. He won okay. the division. He won the playoff game. Sure. You know, Keenum won the poll. He Keenum got That's I because all those U of H fans, but I know, I know. I'm just saying you're 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 ra- you're rousing them right now. They, I don't they, know how anybody can make an argument for Case over TJ Yates. Yeah, I think I it's you know how you know what it is, John. It's just Case is more Houston than than oh, yeah. TJ Yates. You know, the cult, cult hero is a very nebulous kind of term. You, you people will take it and twist it into what their definition of it is. Um, so I think I put up the poll. And I haven't seen the final results, but the three choices I gave were Case Keenum, or TJ Yates, Case Keenum, and then the third one was I can't choose one. I love them both. And about twenty percent of the people said I love them both. I want to say like thirty percent said K or said TJ, and like fifty something percent said. You should have put not, P- P.S. No Cougar fans can vote. I, that's what I should have. I should have had some sort of geo tracking on it to keep all the kooks out of there. <laughs> Uh, all right, John, what do you got going up on the website the next couple of days? I have a column about the playoff race and how D'Amico said he wants the players focused on Cleveland and nobody else. And I said, well, in 2011, when you were playing and you were on your way to your first division title, did you ever look ahead? And he goes, um, I don't remember. That was so long ago. <laughs> That's great. I love D'Amico. He's doing such a great job. And I hear people saying, Kevin Stefanski is going to win Coach of the Year and all these other guys. And I'm thinking nobody has done a better job than him, especially considering how far they've come and all the injuries they've had yeah. to overcome. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, Stefanski's won games with four different quarterbacks. That's pretty admirable. And he's supposed <laughs> to win this year. Yeah, no, I know. And managing that Deshaun situation is not an easy thing either. I, 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 I wouldn't hit – I'm rooting for D'Amico. I would vote for D'Amico. If Kevin Stefanski got it, I would totally understand. But, John, here's the thing. They go head-to-head this weekend. Yes, they do. You want to win it, win it. The the three guys that really seem to be separating themselves from the pack, well, four if you count Dan Campbell, who's always been kind of hanging around near the top of the rankings. But right now, the ones that have the most steam, I think, are D'Amico, Stefanski, and Shane Steichen. And it's kind of cool. We got like a little mini round robin going for D'Amico against two of his Coach of the Year uh, uh, foes right now. I, I think executive of the year could come down to that last game with Chris Ballard and uh, yep. Nick Casario. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Chris Ballard in a year where they, like, as of right now, they blew the fourth pick, you know, like they on a quarterback. Like it's they, they, the, the quarterback that they took with the fourth pick getting hurt was the catalyst for the season that they're having right now. That, that's the truth. That would be my argument against Chris Ballard. Like, okay, well, the most prominent thing that he did that guy getting hurt wound up being the reason they won the division. How can I do like, I, I, how can I process that? I don't, I don't know. Well, he signed, he signed the mustache Gardner Minshew. He did. He did. That's true. That's true. Um, all right, John, well, good stuff. And look forward to doing this again on Thursday when we preview the Browns and the Texans and uh, prayers up that we're talking about CJ Stroud being involved, but I don't feel great about it right now. Uh, Sean, thank you very much. As always, it's an incredible week. Merry Christmas. And happy Happy holidays to everybody. Can't wait for the Cleveland Browns to come to town. Likewise. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. That's how you get us any uh, mailbag questions that you guys have. Um, if uh, if you want to hit us there, if we love it when you hit subscribe uh, and you get this podcast automatically. More and more of you doing that. We appreciate that. Tell a friend, especially if they're a Texan fan about the podcast. We appreciate that as well. We appreciate our producer, James Jackson, back in the saddle today. Uh, and he's the one who gets this podcast out to all of you so, so very quickly. We appreciate James as well. So for James and John, I'm Sean. We are out of time. We will see all of you on Thursday for the next episode, previewing the Browns and the Texans on the Utopia Football Podcast. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. 
If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.